Hello, and welcome to The Granite Beat. I'm Julie Hart, and I'm here with Adam Drapshow. Hello. And we're talking with journalists from around the state of New Hampshire about their experience covering it. Today, our guest is someone who came to journalism on a non-traditional path. Anthony Payton, a regular contributor for the Granite State News Collaborative, is originally from Brooklyn. His column, Common Ground, highlights the diverse makeup of the Granite State. Welcome, Anthony. Hi, Julie. Hi, Adam. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being with us today, Anthony. Could you describe for us the path that brought you to journalism? Adam, I've always been a writer in some um, shape or form. And the thing with journalism that I've, you know, began to really um, understand and writing as a whole, what I know from journalism now and what I've learned from writing as a whole throughout my life is that um, experience plays a big part. Life, life experiences, um, the things that you've seen growing up, um, the things that you're currently involved in, I just had to figure out how to get it categorized, categorized, categorized excuse me, into journalism. Um, I went to a journalism boot camp, and it was one of the best things. that uh, It was like a six-week class, and it gave me a, a great breakdown. That was uh, courtesy of the Naki Loeb School through um, Granite State News Collaborative. That's what brought me around to it, um, um, Julie and Adam. It's um, the things that I have to stay, say, and sometimes I feel like my unique perspective that I can bring to um, any column or article. That actually flows into my next question. What does the New Hampshire media landscape look like to you, and what space do you see your work occupying on that landscape? Wow, great question. So I am always, uh, I'm a big fan of acknowledging growth. Like, New Hampshire has a long way to go in terms of DEI, just equity. In the case any of the um, listeners don't know, is diversity, equity, and inclusion, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, yes, New Hampshire has a long way to go, but it's also, it's also come a long way. And I know this because there isn't real shock and awe to what I've been writing and what I've been doing on my podcast. There has been acknowledgement there's been people like like blown away by it but there's no one that's you know with picket signs outside of my apartment saying that i'm you know speaking the devil's uh sermon so to speak so i think we've come a long way and i think that's where my space is is just continue showing that diversity showing the unity and more important what we have in common that could help make us a better community Yeah, one reason why I find myself so interested in your work is that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and highlighting the diversity that is within the Granite State and is growing, as we know by census data, as well as just from our own experiences. But I wonder, one of the things I wanted to ask you is whether you find any sort of resistance to that, to discussing these topics and focusing on these areas. You started to speak to it a little bit there, but I was wondering if you could give us a greater sense of what the response or feedback you've been getting from your work. So I've gotten a bunch of emails from around the state, um, which I've sent to Melanie, who we all know as um, Granite State News Collaborative, you know, the executive director is my girl. Yeah, Melanie is so great. The whole team, actually. Dr. Kristen Nebius there at the Marlin Fitzwater Center for Communication. Kara Robert, who were at Manchester Inc. Link, and I knew that I just wanted to be my genuine self. So my article actually springboarded, my column springboarded because I was, um, I had a cheesecake issue. So I had to get away from cheesecakes. And I said to myself, look, I want to start eating healthier. So my daughter and I, we go around on excursions. We're going to different supermarkets to find the sweetest and ripest of fruit just to offset this uh, cheesecake issue that I have. I wind up going out to the Walmart and Hookset. I get there um, <clears throat> and I tell this story. I open up with the story. I see a white guy in there. He's big beard, blue jeans, ripped up, dirty t-shirt. And the first thing I say to myself, I say, yeah, that's a proud boy right there. He is MAGA. I bet you in a parking lot, he has a four by four truck with 19 American flags and Trump's picture on it. Not to mention that he had a legal firearm on his, uh, on his side. You know, he had it holstered. Um, how he got into Walmart with that, I, I don't know. I guess they let you, you can have it there. But anyway, um, 
around that time, DMX had just passed away. And this guy, he kept staring at me and I stared at him and we nodded each head, heads at each other just for acknowledgement. And then he said, hey, terrible tragedy, what happened to DMX? So I looked at it as this guy was extending the olive branch. I'm the only black guy in there. And so I didn't take it as offense because I could have said, hey, you know, just because I'm black, listen, I have everything from the Rolling Stones to Led Zeppelin on my uh, music. So don't just peg me to hip hop. I didn't say that. I nodded heads at him. and I was like, yeah, that's terrible. Then he started naming some underground stuff from DMX to where I said, wow, I was like, okay, this, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, it's not just some surface songs that he might have heard. Anyway, we lose sight of each other. We get out in the parking lot. And uh, I catch sight of him again. Now, I don't know where this woman came from, but the person that was helping him with the groceries into the car, and it wasn't a truck and it didn't have American flags on it. It was a sedan, like a Camry or something like that. And the person that was helping him was a black woman, you know, who was clearly his significant other. So I said to myself, I said, wow, this has to be one of the biggest flips you know, that I could imagine. And I guess that was me with my prejudice, you know, me with pointing him out and saying, okay, proud boy, Trump fan. So that was one of the things that sparked it. And when I wrote about that, and when I wrote about black patriotism, how the far right tends to hijack patriotism, that struck a chord with a lot of New Hampshireans. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I'm, I'm going to make it up. But it struck a lot of chords with, with, you know, with a lot of New Hampshireans and that feedback about me saying that, hey, I'm, I'm black. Not only am I black, I'm, you know, what they consider ADOS, you know, American descendants of slavery. So my people actually have blood in this soil. And for me to say that I love this country, but I have issues with it, I'm allowed to. You know, my dad was a Vietnam veteran. I had brothers in the Navy, you know, friends coming back with no limbs. Yeah, like we're patriotic as well, but our story is different. And so I think people just have to recognize and realize that those are some of the bridges. And I think that actually was the number one viewed and listened to uh, podcast that we did on black patriotism. So that's been pretty much the feedback. There hasn't been any real pushback other than some suggestions here and there. But everything thus far has been pretty good. Do you think there's a power in reclaiming that mantle of patriotism? Or if you think about it in terms of advocacy, is there a strategic benefit to reclaiming that mantle of patriotism to frame advocacy or an argument within the bookends of patriotism? I would, Adam. I do believe that there's a strength in it because the way it is sitting right now is that if I speak ill against some of the ills of this country or some of the ills of any political party that I'm not, and I'm unpatriotic. Like who gave you the authority to even say that? So it, it has to swing back around. It has to, you know, I have friends that are in, you know, North the North Conways and the Ossipies of New Hampshire, where, you know, I stick out like a sore thumb in those areas. And these men and some women and I have a great relationship. And these we have, you know, totally different um, views when it comes to maybe politics and things along those lines. The one thing that unites us is that when sometimes we talk about how great the country is, and I will admit like this is the greatest country in, in the world, in my opinion, but that doesn't mean that I, I'm not, I don't have grievances with it, and I'm not allowed to voice those grievances. Now, how I voice them, you know, that's my choosing, but that is the common ground. You love this country, I love this country. You know, I want my children to thrive on this land. This is all I know. You know, it's all my family knows. So of course I'm patriotic. I don't want North Korea or or you know or um China or whoever to bomb us. Like I live here. You know, I was down there for nine eleven. I remember people walking through the streets to donate blood. I was a I'm living New York. I was born and raised in Brooklyn. So I remember that time really well. I remember how much we united as a country all races and there wasn't a hyphen in front of America, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. People want to, you know, hold on to, you know, where their roots are from. But I remember 9-11. I remember how bad of a situation that was for the country. So yeah, we love this country and, and uh, um, you can't not just hijack patriotism and redefine it, you know, saying that I support this guy blindly or this woman blindly and you know, to hell with, that, with everyone else. That's not my definition of patriotism. 
Anthony, your work seems to me to prove the truism that the more specific you make your writing, the more relatable it becomes. For me, one of the most powerful moments in your column was when you wrote about seeing the ultrasound image of your daughter while you were you were beginning a years long prison sentence. Not everyone has had that specific experience, but I think most fathers or parents to be can relate to having their world rocked by one of those grainy black and white images. Could you tell us how you came to the concept of your column? Why was it the right choice to make the column as personal as it is? Great question, Adam. I think it's, I think I knew that I would resonate with people if I told my story from the every person's perspective. Like, yeah, I did. I was sentenced to 120 months in a federal prison. That's 10 years. Three days after my arrest, my fiance at the time told me, hey, I miss my lady time. And the next time I called her, she said, hey, I'm pregnant. And I said, this cannot be happening right now. That ultrasound picture of that little life in the stomach stood, it stayed on the wall in my cell. And that's what kept me out of prison politics. It was me having those fictional conversations with this fetus that I was walking around a prison yard after lifting weights and I would walk the yard and have fictional conversations with this little girl in my head. I don't think it can get much realer than that, you know. And then my dad in 17 is dying from pancreatic cancer. So I said my last words to him over the phone. It, the cycle of life is happening right in front of my eyes. My daughter's being born, my father's dying. If I had to give a backstory into 1998, I was in a New York State prison and my mother died. So I gave both of my parents away to incarceration and was never able to say goodbye properly. And then my daughter was born while I was inside. And when I walked out of these, those prison gates, she just turned six years old. Building that relationship with her and her brothers, rebuilding the relationship with her brothers, there's a lot of people that can relate to parenthood. The, the road that it took for me to get this little girl to trust me was hell. She made me work for every bit of it. And I was up for the challenge. And she will sleep over in this apartment. And when she lays in bed and she's sleeping, I look at her and I start crying. You know, I'm talking about ugly, snot bubble, dry heaving cry. And I think a lot of parents can relate to looking in that room like, wow. Or they can relate to the comeback story. You know, and I think a lot of people love a good comeback story. And where I am in my life right now is unreal. Unreal. Unreal, Adam and, 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 and Julian. That fatherhood aspect and being open and maybe being able to resonate with a parent whose child or friend is on the wrong path. And I can help them get back on. And I can tell them actual horror stories about what I went through. All of the ancillary parts of the criminal justice system and how you do not want to get caught in that web. That's what I'm trying to give to the soccer moms, to the middle-aged dads. You know, to my peers, we're building a nonprofit organization called Boss, which is beating the odds and striving for success. And we're going to be helping men who are getting out of prison with everything from job development to job placement. So that demographic I can speak to. So my writing in the Common Ground Initiative is like, okay, you know what? You know, I want to speak to some of the soccer moms out there. I want to speak to some of the middle-aged guys out there who we may have different political views. And you may see my story as chaotic and just sad, but there's a lot of hope in my story. The bounce back, the comeback is crazy right now. Like, it's just, you know, like, a, like I'm living what I sat and thought about for seven years. You know, I, li I literally sat and thought about the things that I'm doing for six and a half, six years and 10 months to be exact. You know, I sat up and thought and planned and addressed my weaknesses and why other guys were, you know, lifting weights all day or watching ESPN all day or watching Maury Povich and Who's the Dad all day and Springer all day. While those guys were doing that, I was in culinary arts. I stayed in the prison mess hall. I was in the prison library, um, the prison law library. And someone may have a relative 
who is in prison or going to prison. And that literally just happened with me. And not to say names, but a friend, husband, just went in. Before he went in, I sat with the both of them and I told them what to expect. And he sent word back that almost brought me to tears. He said, please tell Anthony, thank you for every bit of information that he gave me because everything that he said came true. You know, everything from making sure you do some manscaping, you know, um, excuse me, Julie, but I'm sure the fellas know what I'm talking about. Before you go in, do some manscaping because you don't know what you, you don't know the next time you'll get a good razor. Until you go to commissary, clip your nails, your toenails, because you don't know when the next time you're going to have. And when you get in there, stay busy and get a routine, you know, and that was just a few of the things I gave him. And every time he calls her, he's like, please tell that guy. I said, thank you. And that warms my heart that even though he is stepping into a dark abyss, I was able to provide a little bit of light and guidance. To, and mind you, the guy is a working class guy. He, Adam, he may be no different than you. He just made some, he just made a mistake, a poor choice in, in, in judgment, you know, and he wound up in the situation that he's in. So I'm always looking for how, nowadays, I'm looking for how I can help, how I can put money in the bank for whoever the big guy or big girl or whoever's upstairs, you know, the higher power, I need to continue putting money in the bank. And I believe this is how I do it. Can you tell me, and this is about both your column and this one-for-one -one service you're providing, such as this gentleman who you helped transition into his time, how does this help you, whether it's your column or the service to others? How does that help with your own personal comeback? Well, the one-on-one -on -one service, that, I did that years ago, but that was, um, the one I did recently, that was like a no-pay thing. That was a friend who's, you know, whose husband really had a situation. She knows my background. And um, I hate to say it, but I guess I'm a subject matter expert. And the subject matter that I happen to be an expert on is um, the criminal justice system and incarceration and pre and post incarceration. So, but with the boss initiative, um, the next chapter that we're building, we look to, like I said, everything from job placement to mental health to um, job development. And we want to take guys who are coming out and who are ready. And we're also aligned with SNU. And SNU has um, Professor Chris Matthews, who has a project called Project AIM. And Project AIM goes into the prisons and help guys get uh, college, college credits. I believe that economics and employment are two of the biggest things that lead to the recidivism rate and guys going back in jail. And I believe a support system is one of the biggest things that keeps a guy out. So it keeps a man or a woman out. So just humbling myself and remembering these guys' stories and where they've been, even the women, we're trying to get a woman's component going as well, because women, if someone had to describe their experience, I, I, I might even venture to say that it's a little bit rougher than the guys. So they need that kind of a support and assistance, because I am where I am right now because of a good support system, because of, um, you know, the Carol Robidoux from Manchester Inc. Link the Melanie Plenders from the Granite State News Collaborative, the Dr. Dr. Uh, Kristen Nevius from right there at Franklin Pierce University. So I always tell people, you know, Alex right there, you know, me and Alex have talked about school. I'm probably twice Alex's age and we've been talking about classes because I'm thinking about going back to Franklin Pierce. Alex kind of has an old soul too, though, man. He's really like a real smooth cat. <laughs> so like we, you know, we go, but yeah, those, you know, that support system. And I tell people all the time, like, if I had to make a Mount Rushmore of women who helped put me where I am now, it would be the women I just said, Carol Robidoux, Melanie Plender, and um, Kristen Nevius. And my daughter might take up the fourth uh, little head on the statue, on the, on, the, <laughs> on the picture. But that support system and people giving you a chance, you showing those people that you deserve the chance, surrounding yourself with the right people, that's how things can work for a person who, who faced that kind of adversity. That's a pretty strong Mount Rushmore you've got there. You mentioned SNU. I just wanted to mention for the listeners, that's Southern New Hampshire. I do. I have just a couple. Anthony, did you find any unexpected challenges you may have faced when you started writing? 
Oh, when I started writing Unexpected Challenges, hmm. To be honest, it was one of the things was, these might be in my memoirs, but there are so things that are so specific and graphic that I kind of want the world to know. But I had to balance that out with um, the cleanliness of putting it in households. If putting my message, hey, look, yes, yes I've, been, I've been where I've been. I've been to prison. I've been to jail. I've hit every level of incarceration with the exception of, of like a military tribunal. You know, and I want no parts of that. I've done county, you know, state, federal. That's it for me. My tour of duty is over. And there are plenty of men and women who are walking around like myself. And so I, I would like to um, amplify those stories, but I need those stories. I have to remember that I have to keep those stories clean. You know, clean and, and it, clean, but at the same time appealing enough to draw people in. Because I'm telling you right now, someone's son or someone da someone's daughter is gaming with someone. And what you don't know is the person that they're gaming with is also the local drug dealer. And your child hangs out with this person that they're gaming with, right? And what your child doesn't know is that that drug dealer friend of his has rivals who might want to take him out. Or the police investigation that's on him. So as soon as your son or daughter says, hey, James, do you have that bag of rice that you said you were going to give me because I want to eat tonight? You know, the federal government will turn that bag of rice into an ounce of cocaine if it hits the wrong way. You know, so that's what conspiracy can do. You know, there's a thing called conspiracy in the federal government. Be careful with it. Um, but just the alignment of your child or your friend's child with someone who is living, you know, life on the other side of the tracks, you know, and as a parent who's oblivious to it, obviously, like, you know, you wouldn't expect that, but that's, that's what's going on out there, you know, and I'm writing about that. Actually, my last two were on Impal and the Manchester Police Athletic League, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of New Hampshire. That's next. And I just did uh, My Turn, which are all organizations that help at-risk youth. And so that's kind of what I'm on and at right now is trying to help at risk youth. You know, and some of these programs are great. They have like, you know, court diversion programs. Does your child, does your son, your nephew, your friend, does he really know everything that comes along with having a criminal record? Like, is he ready for that? Like, does he need to hear my stories? Is being cool really that important? You know, and if there isn't a parent that can't relate to what I'm saying or it's like, hey, you know what? We should listen to this guy a little bit more and not just reject me because of my past. And I think that's their loss. So my final question is about any advice you might have for people interested in journalism who don't know where to start. What advice would you have for them? I just got my youngest stepson, Tavon. He just started writing for Carol at Manchester Inkling. Tavon is 16. He's almost, he's already my height. A few years ago, a year or two ago, you go into his bedroom, it looked like someone was kidnapped in there. There's shirts everywhere, there's a chair in the middle of the floor. There's like, you, you just, it's just crazy. You know, a 16 year old kid, you already know what a bedroom looks like. My bedroom, my apartment doesn't look that great, and I'm three times his age nearly, so. But um, start locally, start with your local newspapers. Have a, a topic or something that really gets you going. Write about, I don't care if it could be the NBA, it could be a football guy, you can be a hunter, you can be a woman who loves to bake, a woman who's in the corporate world. What moves you and what motivates you and how can you tie that to public service and possibly even civic engagement? You know, and that's the route that I took. Someone else's route might not go that way. They may be just, they may be the next Stephen A. Smith or the next Skip Bayless. Who knows? And even with that, you still can affect change just by having a voice and being able to write. So that's what I would say. Start locally and start with something that motivates you, pushes you, and could potentially help other, others. And what would you say to that person if they would then say they don't feel like they see anyone in the media landscape that reflects them, that they might think of themselves as too much of an outsider to the media norm? 
what would you say to them? I just recently spoke with a woman who asked me, is there any programs available that would assist families of the incarcerated? Because incarceration just doesn't affect the incarcerated. It also affects, you know, there's a lot of parts with the children, communities. And so sometimes if you don't see something, why not create it? And that's how I look at it. You don't see enough of yourself in there. Guess what? Go kick, go kick the door in because there's someone in there. And um, there's someone in that room who wants you in there. And I don't care if none of them look like you. There's a, there's a person with a heart in that room. And that's what I caution people to remember when we get polarized by race or we get polarized by politics. And I, I, it's, it's, I'm always reminding brothers, look, man, look, you know, there was some good white people marching with Martin Luther King, you know, and same thing, you know, like not everyone... I don't know, thought OJ was innocent or whatever the situation might have been, you know? So like, you know, there are people who don't look like you who want to see you thrive as well and succeed. So try kicking that door open. And um, if you don't see yourself in there, then put yourself in there. And that goes for anyone, you know, that goes for, um, you know, men, women, LGBTQ, conservative, Democrat, straight, white, male, you know, you, you name it. Um, Muslim, Islamic faith, all right, you know what? If you don't see a version of yourself in there, which I believe is also important, you know, everyone wants that rep everyone wants to see a part of themselves somewhere and your root for it, you know. And that would be my suggestion to them. It's like someone in that room, if I were in the room and I was the only black guy, you know, or there was a bunch of black guys in the Someone came in there that didn't look like us and say, I'm, I'm that guy who's, who's, you know, like, hey, you know, maybe we should give this person, let me hear more of this person. Let me see what they're talking about exactly, you know, because I know that they're forcing, I force my way into, into situations that I wasn't supposed to be in, in a, a most positive and productive way, I should clarify. Yeah, I force and push my way into situations where, hey, look, this is what I'm about. This is what I bring to the table. And it's about time. So that's, that's what be my message to them. Go, you, you kick in the door. Don't wait. Don't wait for it. Push it in and have, have, have a good, strong work ethic and good, strong material and whatever it is you're pushing. Because, and people also has to rem have to remember, they should remember, there's never a, a, a perfect time. And I'm flirting with 50 now. You know, I'm somewhere in a ballpark of flirting with 50. And... This is something that, you know, I've heard about and spoke about in my 20s and things like that, but it really clicks after a certain while. You know what? Look, man, I'm not 20 pounds light, lighter than I wanted to be. You know, my, um, you know, my acne is acting up a little bit, but still what? I'm still getting on this camera. And you have to have some of that in you to, you know, get over that hurdle and take that leap of faith. Well, I think I speak for the both of us when I say we're very glad that you did choose to kick in that door. You mentioned that you're thinking of going back to classes. Do you want to say anything about what's next for Anthony Payton? So I am working, about to begin working on memoirs. And I think in that I'll get a little bit more graphic with things. You know, like I have to point some things out, but I, that's what I'm going to be working on. I'm looking for uh, grants and scholarships because I am now an honorary uh, Raven, so I definitely look on doing the, the um, hybrid classes. More than likely it'll be in human service, um, only because I can swing back around in the nonprofits and be very effective in, in that um, arena. Although writing and communication is my, you know, that's my thing, but I think it's gonna wind up being something that I could benefit and work around with nonprofits and helping people in that sector. So that is one of the things that I can really, really discuss. We're looking to launch Boss early next year. We can use as many supporters for Boss. Like I said, it stands for Beating the Odds and Striving for Success. My friend Anthony Harris is the executive director. My brother Chris is on the board of directors. Antonio Mabin. Um, we have a couple of politicians on our board of directors. And again, Chris Matthews from SNU and Miss Sharon Harris. Very, very effective people see the mission, see what we can do with it, and see the void, and trying to stop that recidivism rate, you know? 
really trying to stop the, that revolving door of going back to prison. And again, like I said, you know, me with the support system, I'm blessed with the support system that I had. Not, a, not many people have that. And support doesn't have to come in, a term, in, in financially. You can be a business owner and you've watched this guy that got out of prison. You've watched him for a whole year struggling and striving. And you might be the thing that lifts him or her, you know, up and over past that hurdle. You know, I don't recommend anyone, you know, a guy, a man or woman just walks out of prison, you know, invite him into your home and all of that kind of, I'm not, a, you know, like watch a person first and you see where they're going and you see what they're studying, what they're listening to and what type of stimulation that they get. You know, what are they feeding themselves in their brains? And more importantly, which is I always ask people, what did they do when they were inside? Because I always say that prison is the microcosm of society. So whatever you were when you were in prison, you're going to be what you get out. And like myself, I said I was in the kitchen all day. Well, guess what? Lo and behold, I'm in the kitchen all day <laughs> out here as well. Pay is 10 times better. you know. And um, I'm looking to get out of that field at some point, even though I love cooking. But I just want to make sure I'm maximizing my potential. So those are some of the things that... Um, really strike with me and, and, and um, you know, resonate. So That's great, Anthony. We can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. I look forward to um, networking with you guys a little bit more. You know, I, I love to see your podcast, you know, go to great heights. And um, like I said, I, you know, anytime you need me on here, um, I have friends that are in the mix of things as well. And we're all part of the same family. So definitely look forward to hooking up with you guys again. Thank you so much, Anthony. Could you just tell us how we could learn more about BOSS? And could you describe specifically what kind of support you're looking for right now at this stage of your development? Well, we're working on the um, housing component. You can reach out to myself, and I'm, I'm easy to find these days, and I don't care that I'm easy to find these days. Um, or Anthony Harris, who's the executive director. He will link you to what exactly resources that we're looking for. But just the support from the community, that's major support from businesses, um, because we look to be putting out a polished product in the form of a human being, human beings. In the form of people, bosses looking to, you know, polish guys up, you know, and, and they're ready. They're college, they have college under their belts, they have job training, job development, job etiquette. You know, you can't be arguing with the, you know, supervisor, like we working on every aspect of that. And that's what we really need is just that support from the community and the support from businesses and just be on the look like B-O-L-O, BOLO, be on the lookout and, you know, just be, um, look to embrace and support when we do take off. Anthony, we're thrilled that you were able to join us today and we're going to be excited to see what's next for all of these initiatives that you've spoken about. It is a great comeback story indeed. Thank you, guys. The Granite Beat is a project of the Granite State News Collaborative in partnership with the Laconia Daily Sun. We record at the Lakeport Opera House, and our theme music is composed by Bob McCarthy. Thanks also to the Marlin Fitzwater Center at Franklin Pierce University for editing and other support.